Well, hello, my favorite people on the face of the earth. How are you today? You know what I'm going to do today? We're going to just dive right in to an unbelievable microcosm of crazy, radical, intelligent evil and the wonderful deliverance that comes when we finally understand the truth. Oh, I'm so fired up. Okay, full disclosure, I've been reading into this book again here, you guys, The Underground History of American Education by John Taylor Gatto, and I just got done with a chapter. It's called The Eyeless. <laughs> it's so bright. It's called Eyeless in Gaza. This is a euphemism back to Samson getting his eyes gouged out and being dragged away. It's fantastic. And he goes into an area where, okay, I'm just going to put it this way. I'm really amped up right now. I'm like, I'm so excited. You know, I'm one of these people that when I read books, my toes start dancing like uncontrollably because it, it starts a catalyst of procedures inside my mind of like new connections being made. Like there's a fire inside my brain that is just burning, baby. It's burning good right now. Now, this comes from a lot of conversations. Today, we're going to deal with like the war on words. All right. Like not just words, war on reading. Okay. Because this is a this is a segment of the war of the ages that we can never lose sight of like why is it there has been such a concentrated maniacal effort to eliminate in people the desire to read and not just the desire you kill the desire by making it something that they're unable to do it's the easiest thing to do to somebody it's called learned helplessness when you put a book in front of somebody that is illiterate it's it's almost embarrassing and frustrating and shameful all at once, right? And the vast majority of people that I do interact with have this hidden secret. They have a secret that they don't want to admit in that they can't read. And they may be able to read some, but they're not proficient. They're not capable of just picking up any book. Like if I'm going to make a recommendation, like you guys need to read this book. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. You read this book. It'll give you so much information and understanding. The vast majority of people that I say that to they might buy the book, but the very, very few of those will actually read the book. And I'm starting to understand why. And this came because my wife was able to get really vulnerable with me. And not just my wife. Now, other people have come along and shared this same, for them, humiliating secret that they carried with them their entire life. For those of you guys that don't know my wife, Chelsea, she is an incredibly intelligent woman. She's very, very sharp. Like when I met her, you know, she had all the accolades that any mom or dad should be super proud of. I always tell people like Chelsea was like the, the dream girl of everyone's life. And then she met me. <laughs> hey, hon, what's up? <laughs> Busted. I am. Yes, I am. I'll be out in a little bit. <laughs> Everything was going along great until I showed up. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot like that. Our story is an absolute tragedy for the beginning of it. It gets way better, but in the beginning, it's a nightmare. You know what I'm saying? That being said, my wife is an absolutely brilliant woman. I love her tremendously. And she graduated as like valedictorian of her high school. You know what I mean? She was like the 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 highest scoring soccer player period like she set state records you know she was like on the newspaper front front page of the newspaper like her family had stacks and stacks and stacks of like the accolades of chelsea you know she was like a hero a hero of all of these people you know what i'm saying but my wife had a secret this entire time growing up throughout her life she didn't really know how to read well she didn't she went to college she graduated she worked as an rn residential nurse like very successful career in, in the medical industry all that time she was faking it. She was faking it. She was hiding a deep, deep, deep reality that she could not actually read well. She couldn't read and comprehend words. She struggled terribly to do that. And so if like I sat down and talked to her about books I was reading and stuff I was reading and like super excited and enthusiastic and wanting her to read something, it wasn't going to happen. She would, she would go off like quietly or privately and try to read it. And I didn't know this at all for maybe Gosh, until we are in the RV, so probably 10 years into our marriage, easily, before she finally broke down one day because we would read the scriptures together on the Sabbath. And we were like, I would read and then I would like she would read, you know, but she really didn't like to read and she hated reading out loud. Oh, it happened because I called on her like with the, in a group of people and I asked her to read something and she got like real embarrassed. Like she was like, didn't want the spotlight on her at all. She was like 
face flushed. And then she was super mad at me later on. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't know you don't, you don't want to read. Okay, that's fine. But later on, like it revealed, it brought out this, this deep shame and embarrassment that she had, that she's not good at reading. And that's how she would describe it. And it's taken years of her deliberately trying to work against that to try to dismantle. First of all, it was like the confession of that that helped to free her from the bondage of shame and embarrassment that she had. It's like, it's not something she needed to be embarrassed about. It's something she needed to be truthful about because the person she's hurting inherently is herself. But what it really came to the surface is when she started trying to homeschool my daughters, right? Naomi and Jubilee, specifically with Naomi. Now, like we don't homeschool in a, a way that is uh Obviously, as you can imagine, you guys, we don't teach our children by the book. You know what I'm saying? We teach them by this book. You betcha. We're like, you read this book. It's life. But when we pick up school books, curriculums, I'm going to dismantle those things like a serious assassin with a knife. You know what I'm saying, son? It's coming at it because I can't stand it when people teach deceptive things or falsehoods. And I find it in all kinds of Christian books, just along with all kinds of other rhetoric, just garbage rhetoric that people put in these things. That being said, there's some benefits to having a system of instruction. But one of the tools that someone gave us along the way was a book that was called Teach your children to read in a hundred easy lessons. I think that's what it's called. It's like, pick this up later on. Teach your child to read in 100 easy lessons. Siegfried Engelman. Anyways, this was the book, right? But it was not based off the methodology that Chelsea was trained with. Chelsea and those of you, the vast majority of every one of you who is listening to this or watching this, whenever that may happen, the vast majority of people that struggle with reading, it's because you were taught word-based memorization as the means to reading as opposed to phonics-based form of like alphabet, right? That words make sounds, sounds make words, or sorry, letters make sounds. And these sounds are used to build words and sentences and chapters and books and pages, right? Word-based memorization is the vast majority of all indoctrinational schooling methodologies that's taught out there. And this has been going on in a war there's been a war in the education system in order to bring this to pass. Last time in our previous episode on spheres of authority, we went into dealing with the spiritual hierarchy that's behind the scenes. And one of those powers, like we talk about principalities and powers and rulers, dominions, like there's this ranking system of those agents of evil behind the scenes that are stirring up and agitating their, their human assets on the earth to deploy methods to eradicate their enemies, right? The real war that I'm consistently finding throughout history when I look back and examine, where did all of this come from? Like, who was it that taught people to read in a way that was not beneficial? In fact, that most of the origin stories that when we dig into the, the closets of the influencers who brought about this other form of reading because before this literacy rates were exceedingly high like 90 percent 98 percent like people knew how to read and i'm not talking about just like a book like this would be considered very elementary books to fifth graders okay the required reading list to a fifth grader back in the early 1800s would blow your stinking socks off. Most 18, 20, most people, adults, cannot read what basic fifth graders were capable of reading with competency 150 years ago. But that was by design. You're not stupid. Somebody that had a radical motivation to ruin your ability to think critically for yourself and analyze information and make strong, assertive decisions based off of what you learned waged a war against you to keep you from ever being able to do any of those things. This, what I find every time I dig back into the closets of history of like, when did this go wrong? Where did this come from? I find the very same fingerprints of secret societies and people that had sworn allegiances to these other gods who were literally working within these clandestine criminal organizations to change the minds of the people. And you see one of the most predominant effective tools that people had utilized for hundreds and thousands of years was the scriptures. The scriptures was one of the most effective tools. Like in 1611 with the publication of the King James, the 
authorized King James version of the Bible, it gave access to to and things like the Geneva Bible as well. There's other Bibles that came to the f- surface right then, but really the 1611 brought forward to many what had been inaccessible for so long because it's a very the scriptures is a very dense book in that it has so much complications about all the different facets of life. And if you read it, and I mean, you actually read it for yourself at an early age, it sets a foundational perspective on so many different topics, whether it's political, economic, spiritual, psychological, financial. It covers so many different arenas from science to the literature to philosophy. It covers so many different arenas that it would give you a firm foundation of understanding that you could launch from there into so many different areas of expertise. And a lot of this got catalyzed when I was reading Luke earlier this week, okay? There's this sentence. Let me just go back for a second here. We'll we'll hit Luke in a second here. But as Chelsea was trying to teach Naomi how to read, right? My daughter, Naomi, she was like not as interested in it early on. You know, like we were living on farms at the time, full time. We were doing a lot more outdoor educational experiences. Like, hey, here's how you butcher a chicken, honey. Like she was, she was way more immersed in that type of environment at the time. Seed, seed planting, harvesting. We were doing a lot of that kind of educational training. You know, her, she was going along with her parents into the greenhouses and the fields. You know, and raising animals with us and sheep and and. Uh, she had horses to help take care of. Like she had a very different early on in those beginning years. But then as we were back into the RV and we stopped working out on these farms and stuff, she had a desire to start to read really more so at like six years old and now at seven years old where it's really built up like crazy. But because of that, my wife was able to start to identify, oh my gosh, I don't know how to read because I don't know how to sound out words. That was it. She just realized like, I don't know how to sound out words. I just know if I don't memorize the words, I don't know what they mean. And so because of that, she avoided reading because it would confront in her an inability. Like it sucks. It never, I hate feeling ignorant. Nobody feels good when they're confronted with like an impossible situation they can't overcome. But because she's had these children in her life and because she committed herself to not separating herself, divorcing herself from her children and the responsibilities of being a mother. And, and she took on the burden of raising her own children and teaching them and educating them for herself. It revealed in her areas of this weakness, and because of it, it's brought this transformational understanding to her. And I see what the good fruits of that have been because now as she's teaching my children how to read, she's teaching herself how to read just as much so. And because of that, her confidence in reading has grown exponentially. And it's been a beautiful thing to get to see my wife grow in her capacity to be able to sit down and read the scriptures, understand what she's saying, and not feel like she's so slow to read. Because a lot of people that are slow to read, and it's very, very hard for them to work through in reading, it burdens their mind so heavily that it's it's just exhausts them. And so they can't pursue it. So like when I give somebody a challenge, like read through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, they see this book as what is 1200, 1200 pages of words, many of which they don't have memorized that they don't understand, especially in different translations. Like the King James version of the Bible has one of the best textual preservations of the original text that they were given to it, right? The King James used better manuscripts when they translated it into English that they had. The scriptures here chose the Masoretic text, not as good, right? However, the ill read, the read, the ready, the readability, I'll say that, of the scriptures translation compared to the readability of a King James version is night and day. And one of the major things that this scriptures does that is my favorite thing about it is that it preserved the names of our creator and the Messiah, as opposed to putting titles like they, they, instead of using God and Lord as a title that can mean any stinking thing you want, they use the specific name like yod heh vav heh in Hebrew or in, in the New Testament where you see the name of the Messiah, you see yod heh vav shin ayin, Yeshua. They preserved those things as well as they preserved in this, the way of saying the names that phonetically sounds like it says it in Hebrew. And this is a way for me to train myself into another language. I want to be able to read Hebrew. I want to understand it. I can't yet. But I've been working my way towards that. And I had to go back to the building blocks of ancient Hebrew 
the original language that was given to man in the garden, the first alphabet. It's called the Aleph Bet. This is the first form of all language came from Hebrew. It's not Phoenician. People say Phoenician. This is because there is a giant conspiracy to always hide the hand of the creator everywhere. They're like, don't you think it came from the Bible and those, those Torah keeping hippie Hebrews? Don't you think that? It came from the Garden of Eden, you guys. Like the word became flesh way long ago. The word, literally, that's like the, the hallmark identifying characteristic of our creator is the word that he breathed out. And because of that, this is what differentiated the Hebrew children and the Hebrew men and women as some of the wisest, most powerful people on the earth for generations. There's a reason Daniel, like I have these goals in my life of having my children emulate people that I find in the scriptures. Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and oh, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael. Oh, yeah. And Daniel, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's so much easier to remember those names. It's so bad. But their their story in Daniel 1 has been like the framework of like my cry since I was a little boy. I've always longed to be like that. I wanted to be able to have wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and the favor of the rulers, of the kings and the queens. Like I wanted to have that to be somebody that could fit in a capacity as a counselor towards the people that had influence and power in the world. Because I saw that came from Yahuwah, but it came from them studying Hebrew. These these children were raised in the Torah, the loving instructions of the Father. They were raised in the writings of the prophets before them. They were raised on a rich history that gave them a foundation for navigating the world. Like it made them well versed in navigating the world. And when you see the Messiah in Luke two, let's go there with me for a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna try maybe to read you guys just this entire chapter at the end of this um, from this book because it's so good. And I, I know if I start to read into it at different sections, I'm gonna wanna read a lot of it. So I think what I'm gonna probably try to do instead is just read the entirety of the chapter at the end of this so that those of you guys that wanna hear it can understand like the real history of it, who the players were that came in along the way and began to dismantle and destroy people's ability to read, to create a propaganda class like they want to weaponize and commercialize the minds of men they wanted to like create bricks in babylon like literally they actually like say this kind of stuff it wasn't just just me conspiracy ish kind of statement they literally wanted to ruin people's minds and to look at them as like lumps of dough that they could turn into anything they wanted like they wanted to turn them into bricks for babylon straight up but this isn't always how it has been with parents that vigilantly guarded their children. When you've got a protective parent class, they're not stinking having none of that, son. Like better to go on the run with your children than to be trapped in the holistic mindset of the devils around you. You know what I'm saying? Like get the heck out of there. Because it's bad. You're literally, you're sending your children into a school program that's designed to teach them disabilities. Like permanent disabilities. That's what they're there to do. They're like, if they wrote on the doors that in this place, we're going to give your children neurological and spinal permanent injuries, lasting injuries, right? They're like, we're going to separate your C4 from your C3 of every child that walks in the doors. Who the heck's going to take their children there? You know what I'm saying? But they have all kinds of flowery language and good advertising and good marketing and laws that mandate you take your children to that place and it's free. It's free daycare. They get you on the daycare hook, you know, early on. They're like, this is just get you a break, mom and dad. You guys just need a little break from raising those troublesome children. If you stop poisoning them and feeding them nightmares and garbage and death all the time, they become a lot better children. Just start there. Fundamentals. I'm going to get lost in the weeds and nutrition. Hang on for a second. Okay. Just first, just seriously. It's like the difference of like, my family would go hang out with somebody else whose children eat kind of whatever. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, they give their children candy, what like snacks that are super highly processed with food dyes and aluminum lake. And they're like, it's got yellow five and red 40 and all the other stuff that I'm like, oh, fantastic. Oh, great. My children are looking at me like, oh, can we eat this stuff? Can we eat this stuff? Can we eat this stuff? I'm like, it's death. And they're all like, okay. You know, but occasionally they get some, you know, and then they're like psychopaths. You know what I'm saying? You ever seen this? You parents that like guard your children so that they eat really pure, like real whole food ingredients, like natural, organic, like minimally processed foods. You go hang out with the children and they get into that garbage and they're like, 
they're literally like a demon possessed child. You're like, what the heck? They're casting out there. Like, get out of behind you in the show's name. Get out of the child. They're like, <sighs> it's red 40s, right? And it's just they're eating aluminum and pesticide. It's such a high quantity. And they're like, I got Fruit Loops, mom. I feel like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens, you guys. That's designed that way. It's designed. So then parents are like, oh my gosh, let me get you on bipolar medication for the rest of your life. You should be on antidepressants, honey. I don't know why you're schizoaffective, but I got it. Don't you worry. Let's go to the doctor. He's got all some some kind of chemical drug that'll fix you real quick. And your child comes back with a borderline drool, but they're no longer climbing the walls. And you're like, sweet mercy. You are such a deliverer. Thank you, white robe priest, for saving my life. <sighs> Sorry. I couldn't help it, you guys. It's just, it's a, it's a landmine. The world is run by dragons. Okay, let's read the Bible, shall we? Just for a moment. Oh, man. Here come the baby murderers. <laughs> I'll skip that part. Luke is crazy, you guys. I mean, the Bible's just a savage book. They're like, and it came out in a degree. And the people that are going down and coming them down. Check this out. Okay, all right. We all know basic form of the story. Not Christmas time frame, by the way. Sting it. Throw that garbage out the door. Yeshua is born not during winter. Tuck that away. Might save you from a lifetime of paganistic ideologies. Anyways, you ready for this? Check this out. And Yosef and his mother were marveling at what was said about him. This is in verse 34. We'll jump in. And Shimon blessed them and said to Miriam, his mother, See, this one is set for a fall and a rising of many in Israel, and for a sign spoken against, and a sword shall pierce through your own being, so as to reveal the thoughts of many hearts. Anytime you hear somebody talk about thoughts and hearts and the sword, man, come on, you should get excited because this should pop into your mind. Hebrews 4.12. You know what I'm saying? The word of Elohim is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the bone and the marrow, the soul and the spirit, and is the discerner, the divider of the thoughts and the intentions of the hearts of man. All is laid bare before it. Like, that's the sword that's going to pierce through the hearts of everyone. It's the words that's going to come out of this man's mouth that will literally divide the nations. The man who was born, this little baby right now, this little tiny infant, eight-day-old infant, right? It's like just been circumcised. He's going to get dedicated to Yahuwah, right? He's like the firstborn that came out of the womb as a male. He belongs to Yahuwah unless he gets ransomed out of that, right? They're practicing the Torah. Like there's a literal instruction about this stuff. And so his parents, are they know the Torah. They know the instructions. And they're like, they're going to follow it. The words that are going to come out of this man's mouth, literally, from that moment on to eternity, will divide the nations. He's going to sit down on a white throne at the very end of it all. And at his words, people will live or they will die. This is the division of what the most powerful things that's going to come out of his mouth. Understand, some are going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord. And he is going to say, and look at them. I never knew you get away from me. And they're like, but we did miracles in your name. We did miracles. We cast out demons in your name. And he's going to say, get away from me. Like he's going to divide people so powerfully. Every word of this scripture is so divisive. And the words that came out of his mouth were divisive, but they were revelatory. And this is like the literal prophecies about what's going to happen through this man is starting from this moment. Anyways, let's jump in. And there was Hannah, a priest, a prophetess, a daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with a husband seven years from her maidenhood. And she was a widow of about 84 years who did not leave the set apart place, but served Elohim with fastings and prayers night and day. Hallelujah for your intercessors out there. Come on, some of you ladies and some of you mighty men out there, you crazy, incredible intercessors. We need you like crazy. And she, coming in at that moment, gave thanks to Yahuwah and spoke of him to all who are waiting for redemption in Yerushalayim. And when they had accomplished all matters according to the Torah of Yahuwah, they returned to Galil, to their city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, being, being filled with wisdom, and the favor of Elohim was upon him. So he grew. It says it twice, like he grew and became strong in spirit and with was filled with wisdom. So where did that come from? Where did that come from? It says clearly also the favor, the grace of Elohim 
was upon him. It's like the spirit of Elohim was upon him. He grew in the Ruach of his spirit. But how did that happen? Joseph doesn't get a lot of press coverage in the story of the Messiah, but believe me you, he raised his son up in the ways of Yahuwah, and because it is end, he did not depart from it. Later on in his life, people would look at him and say, who the heck taught you letters? John 7, there's a lot of confusing things about Messiah when he showed up because the guy opened his mouth and he burned the world to ashes. You know what I'm saying? He burned the political system down, the religious system, the economic system. He turned the world upside down with the words that came out of his mouth. And they literally are sitting there like, what the heck? Who are you? This is chapter seven. And after this, Yeshua was walking in Galil, for he did not, that's the home place where he came from, right? For he did not wish to walk in Yehuda because the Yahudim were seeking to kill him constant murderers and the festival of the yahudim was near the festival of sukkot so his brothers said to him get away from here and go into yahuda so that your taught ones also see the works that you were doing for no one acts in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly if you do these works show yourself to the world for even his brothers did not believe in him yeshua therefore said to them my time has not yet come but your time is always ready it is impossible for the world to hate you, but it hates me because I bear witness of it that its works are wicked. You go up to this festival. I am not yet going up to this festival, for my time has not yet been filled. And having said this to them, he stayed in Galil. But when his brothers had gone up to the festival, they also went up, not openly, but as it were in secret. The Yahudim, therefore, were seeking him at the festival and said, Where is he? And there was much grumbling about him in the crowd. Some were saying, he is good. Others were saying, no, but he is leading the crowd astray. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Yahudim. And about the middle of the festival, Yeshua went up into the set-apart place, and he was teaching. And the Yahudim were marveling, saying, how does this man know letters, not having learned? Yeshua answered them and said, my teaching is not mine. But his who sent me. If anyone desires to do his de desire, he shall know concerning the teaching, whether it is from myself or from Elohim. He who speaks from himself is seeking his own esteem, but he who seeks the esteem of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Does not Mo did not Moshe give you the Torah? Yet will no one of you does the Torah. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered and said, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Yeshua answered and said to them, I did one work, and because you all marvel, because of this, Moshe has given you the circumcision. Though it is not from Moshe, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the Torah of Moshe should not be broken, are you wroth with me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Therefore, some of them from Jerusalem in said, Is this not he whom they are seeking to kill? And see, he speaks boldly, and they say none at all to him. Could it be that the rulers truly know that this is truly the Messiah? This, see, he's speaking here so boldly, and he's teaching so powerfully, and the, the, the intelligentsia, the academics of the room are sitting there wondering, who taught him letters? Who taught him to read? Who taught him to understand and decipher and communicate? Who taught him rhetoric? Like, they want to know this stuff because by all appearances on the outside, he comes from a very normal, plainly type of lifestyle. He doesn't come from them. He's not like Shaul or Paul, right? Who's like, I am raised up by, by Gamaliel. I sat at the feet of, I'm the most taught Pharisee of Pharisees, right? Nobody questioned where Paul learned. But they all are sitting there wondering, where did he learn these things? But the secret really lies back in Luke chapter 2. We don't understand one of these things. Here it is later on. Let's just keep reading here. And his parents went up to Jerusalem every year at the festival of Pesach. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the practice of the festival. When they had accomplished the days as they returned, the child Yeshua stayed behind in Jerusalem, when his parents did not know it. But thinking he was in the company, they went a day's journey and were seeking him among relatives and friends. And having not found him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. 
And it came to be after three days they found him in the set-apart place, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And having seen him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? See, your father and I have been anxiously seeking you. And he said to them, Why were you seeking me? Did you not know that I had to be in the matters of my father? But they did not understand the word which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these matters in her heart. And Yeshua increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with Elohim and men. Do you understand something? He was well read in understanding. When you set somebody like a 12 year old, think about this. Our society, when we talk about a 12 year old, people think of sixth graders, right? This, inf this infantized version of a young man, completely different from what reality for thousands of years, cross culturally across the world, people have understood a 12 year old was a young man. He was not a child anymore. Children die off around the age of seven, eight, nine years old, almost universally across the world. And they become young men and young women from that day forward, right? There's a reason it's very beneficial for a child to have some type of significant communication of an experience that the days of childhood are being put to death and the days of manhood, manhood or womanhood are arising for them. But inside institutionalized schooling, we are forcing them into a model of artificial extension of adolescence. We're, we're training them to stay children for as long as possible into perpetuity. That's the goal. They want them to stay children indefinitely. So you can be a child still at 60 years old or at 16 years old or 26 years old. And it's basically accepted that you never grew up. Like I sit down in coffee shops. I'm not a good, not often. Like if I'm waiting for something, I got to sit down in a coffee shop, right? I go into the corner and I'd like to bait the beach. You guys know what I'm saying right here? I like to bring books that are provocative <laughs> and I set them up next to me in a way so that all these titles like the Sharif imperative i've got other ones that are like very like it's sensational genesis 6 conspiracy right the giants war against mankind gary wayne's book set the bible there too you know what i'm saying like i'll set different types of books up to try to create conversation starters because i'm hunting the souls of men everywhere i go just trust me man i'm looking for a door in you know what i'm saying but i'm sitting in coffee shop recently and i was listening in the conversations that began to take place, right? It's like I'm I'm a like a, a freak show level human observer when it comes to like there's a, a room. I'm gonna listen to everybody's conversation constantly. I'm gonna sit myself in a corner of the room that gives me good acoustics so I can it's like a living microphone, you know. Just depending on where you sit in a room, you can hear even better. Anyway, so I'm just listening in on the topics of conversations that were going on in the room. And it was wild to get to see. I do this all over the country and it's a really fun little social experiment to just find out what's the pulse of the of the people. You know what I'm saying? And I was sitting in this room and in this, this place, there was business conversations that were taking place, you know, quiet, hushed people that were doing like work, right? They had a zoom call going on with different people that were participants in it. Right. And then there were some people that were over in a different corner and they were planning a car show, right? These are guys in their forties. There's a, there's like a 30 something guy in there too, but they were 30, 40, 50, 60 year old guys. And they were planning a car show. And I was getting to hear behind the scenes of like how they were trying to get people to come to this car show and how people that had had a car show in the past had been successful. And the, the guy that was younger and wanting to do a different version of it, they were like, they were going back and forth on like what they could do to get people to come to the car show and how to contribute and stuff like that. And then over on the other corner, I heard people that were doing real estate deals and talking about ways that they'd been successful on certain deals and other deals, right? But I can take the same type of conversation that was going on back and forth between these people. And I can travel to a different part of the country and listen into the coffee shop conversations, right? And I get to hear people that are talking about Netflix and TV shows and sports and entertainment. And I began to sit there. And as I'm, if I've heard the difference between why is it that these people are having conversations like this? Like, why is it when I go to a certain type of demographic of a coffee shop, like where it's actually located in a city, why is it I hear conversations from people that are clearly well-read and well-educated on like 
reality of life and then others that are so trapped in a different matrix. You know, I can go sit in a Bible study, right? And hear the types of conversation. I can understand what depth that people have, a familiarity they have with the scriptures. Well, how is it that this 12 year old back then could go sit in a room with people that had devoted their entire lives to studying the scriptures and he is learning and listening from them, but they likewise are learning and listening from him because he was well-trained in the word from the earliest formative years of his life. Understand that back then, a child that wanted to become like a Pharisee, right? For example, that child was required to memorize the entirety of the, of the Torah at a very early age, like five and six years old, seven years old. They would have the entire Torah often memorized by the time they were a teenager, 12 or 13 years old. This is a huge, massive undertaking. People, if I tell them most, most adults who are still stuck in the 12 year old time of life for them to try to memorize the, the entire Old Testament. I can't even imagine doing that myself. I'm not trying to like put myself on a pedestal. I can't do that right now. You know what I'm saying? But children back then were looked at as fully capable of doing these types of things. And then they were trained in order to be able to do them, but not just memorization for regurgitation. It's so that they could connect the dots of the topics that they were learning and reading about. This, this was well understood as something people were capable of. However, there was still even at that time a priest class, an intelligentsia, that they kind of had control over that. And this is why it's so shocking to them that this man seemingly coming out of nowhere from nobody was as well-trained and exceedingly more so than them at any stage in their life. And they don't understand where that came from. But my contention is it came from a powerful home education program and from going to the Sabbath where they heard Moses being taught. Like the commandment in Acts 15, where they're like like addressing like, what are the most important things we can teach new believers? And they're like, well, we should deal with dietary laws, you know, like not eating blood, not eating animals that die from strangulation, abstaining from stuff sacrificed to idols. And then they're commanded to go and listen to Moses, the Torah being taught in every Sabbath. Like, this is because that's where wisdom can come from. Like it, there's a foundation of reading the scriptures that if you do it, it's literally the source of wisdom. But if you do not train a child to have a regard for the word, you are eliminating in them the most powerful weapon that they could have in their arsenal, the foundation with which to move and to live and to breathe the rest of their life. And I, I'm over the course of this, I've been trying to understand as I'm reading through like what goes into phonics, what goes into these different learning systems that are that are put in. And I'm I'm trying to go back in my memory and understand where where did my understanding for reading, my love for reading come from early on in my life. And I'm and I'm I, I am having a hard time remembering like who is it specifically that taught me to read? Because I bounced around from so many different schools early on in my life. I went from private schools to public schools to home schools. I went all through this circuit. You know, I changed multiple schools sometimes during a year. And I'm trying to remember, like, what was it that, like, somebody sat down and taught me? I know at one of those, phonics was taught because I can remember sounding out words consistently. But I remember at different schools, it was like, memorized dog and Jane and cat and these other kinds of just goofy levels of reading. But I had a very high aptitude to reading very early on. And because I had a desire to understand, it launched me into a life of love for reading. It was like the escape tool that I saw. It was like a key that could get me out of this prison. I know one of those people was my mother. I know my mom deliberately spent time trying to teach me how to read, but you got to understand my family where I was raised was an environment of mind-controlled slaves that were raised by mind-controlled slaves that were raised by mind-controlled slaves. But inside that network was a bunch of brilliant people, incredibly smart people who had very, very, were very gifted at reasoning and reading, you know, and a lot of them weaponized that. Understand there was a lot of weaponization of that intelligence against man to make them slaves, but it showed me the power of learning to read. And because of that, I've always had a strong regard for it and a desire to understand for myself. And the people that are well-read are just so much better versed at navigating all of this stuff. I'm going to read just a couple excerpts from this chapter before I launch into it, because there's a few gems in here that I don't, I, those of you that aren't going to listen to the entirety of this chapter, I just want to make sure you get some of the highlights in it, okay? Maybe I will. I'm already 40 minutes in. Oh, exciting. Check this out. Mm. All right, we're going to go. This is in, so he picks this up. This is in chapter three. 
just jump in. You know what? I'm going to try to just do a disciplined reading of this entire chapter. Guys, I challenge you, just listen through this chapter. There's going to be sections in it, you guys, that might be a little bit academic. They might be a little bit hard to understand. But listen, grab the meat as much as you can as we go along in here because there's some studies of examining where so much of this came from that dissolved for so many people, their ability to actually be able to read the word for themselves, to be able to regard it. That's why I did the audio recording of the scriptures. Like that's of anything I've produced in my life. That's of the greatest value, like the greatest thing I've ever done that I'm most thankful that I finished was the audio scriptures. So that even if you can't read it for yourself, well then, you know what? I have a voice and I will, I will read it to you because I love you and I want you to understand the blessings that come from reading. It's not just the words, but it's the understanding that comes from it. When you jump into a book, you have uninterrupted time inside the mind of the author. Okay. When you jump into a chapter in the book of Luke, you're jumping into the mind of somebody that lived in a time that was contemporaneous with the very people that were living with the Messiah. Like when you jump into the book of second Kings, you're stepping back into a time that spanned hundreds of years of the history of the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah and the nations of the world. You're jumping back into specific microscopically small moments, like people eating a pot of stew moments to thousands of years, timeframes of prophecy, all at the, all happening intermingled with each other. It's an incredible gift to be able to read. It's an incredible gift to be able to read. It's one of the greatest things we can ever impart to anybody is a love for the word, right? Because it allows us to then think critically and make connections that you can't make outside of it. That's why the scriptures is called a living book because not only are you different every time you read it, but there's a spiritual empowering to that book that makes it unique and it changes you, it transforms you. It's like the same thing that happens when you consume a piece of food, when I eat a piece of fresh milled bread, right? What happens inside my body is transformational. It goes from a, a thing that came from the earth and it gets converted into literal energy in my body that can be used for so many things. It literally turns into energy in my brain that fires off so many hundreds of thousands of processes that allow me to breathe and eat and run and jump and think and calculate and problem solve comes from this catalyst of grain. This is what happens with words. And that's why words are so dangerous in a society where deception Subtle craftiness, absolute manipulation is the key. You can't have critically thinking people. You don't want 12-year-old Jesuses running around in society. You don't want little Daniels walking around who are able to reason with a 40-year-old man when they're 12. People don't like that in a society that's trying to crush autonomy. It's trying to destroy self-starters and entrepreneurs. They want to dissolve our ability to stand up against absolute lies and obscuring of the facts. They don't want people that understand informed consent is the prerequisite upon which all medical things should be built. They don't want any of that. And so if you have children who are well-versed in being able to identify fallacies, logical fallacies, they're not going to be able to confuse you with pretty coloring on the packaging. You understand what I'm saying here? So a political candidate is going to be call, able to be, you're going to be able to identify that a political candidate is absolutely put up a facade and you can see right through it, right? My, my seven-year-old is better trained at that than most seven-year-olds I interact with. It's really sad, but it's absolutely the case. And it has to do with the early foundational years of what the first thing they did to ruin a child is to shove them into a schooling system that teaches them stupidity and boredom over and over and over again. Before I get too lost in those weeds, you guys, let's jump in here. Oh, it's so good. He's got a reference for Samson, another Nazarite. You know what I'm saying? I've obviously got a bias there. All right. You guys ready for this? Let's jump in here. Chapter three, Eilis in Gaza. The deeds were monstrous, but the doer, Adolf Eichmann, was quite ordinary. 
commonplace, and neither demonic nor monstrous. There was no sign in him of firm ideological convictions or of specific evil motives, and the only notable characteristic one could detect in his past behavior, as well as in his behavior during the trial, was something entirely negative. It was not stupidity, but thoughtlessness. Might, not the problem of good and evil, or faculty for telling right or wrong, be connected with our faculty for thought. Hannah Arendet, The Life of the Mind. The School Edition. I always knew school books and real books were different. Most kids do. But I remained vague on any particular grounds for my prejudice until one day, tired of the simple-minded junior high school English curriculum, I decided to teach Moby Dick to 8th grade classes. A friendly assistant principal smugged a school edition into the a friendly assistant principal smuggled a school edition into the book purchases, and we were able to weigh anchor the next fall. What a book! Ishmael, the young seaman who relates Melville's tales, is a half-orphan by decree of fate, sentenced never to know a natural home again. But Ahab is no accidental victim. He was conscientiously willed his own. He has consciously willed his own exile from a young wife and child, from the fruits of his wealth and from earth itself in order to pursue his vocation of getting even. Revenge on the natural order is what drives him. War against God and family. To me, it defines the essence of Americanness. It's no accident that America's three classic novels, Moby Dick, The Scarlet Letter, and Huckleberry Finn, each deal with ambiguous families, or that each emerges from a time not far from either side of the Civil War. America had been an inferno for families, as Melville, Hawthorne, and Twain all knew. Midway, through our first full century as a nation, the nearly universal American experience of homelessness found its voice. Ishmael is a half-orphan, Ahab, an absentee father and husband, the Harpooners, expatriate men of color, Pearl, a bastard, Hester, an adulteress, the Reverend Dimsdale, a sexual predator and runaway father, Huck Finn, de facto, an adoptee, Jim, a twice-uprooted African slave. When we think what our schools become, we need to recall what a pile of us are homeless. We need to recall what a great pile of us are homeless. We long for homes we can never have as long as we have institutions like school, television, corporation, and government in loco parentis. Patricia Lines of the U.S. Department of Education in trying honorably to discuss what the rank and file of homeschoolers actually do, finally, de finally declared it seems to be wrapped up closely with a feeling of intense interest in the life of the community. And above everything else, she found loyalty in the warp and woof of the family. Homeschoolers are tremendously loyal as family members. They are suspicious of television and other less intimate influences. They eat as a family, they socialize as a family, they attend church as a family, they become members of an extended homeschooling family, homeschooling community. American great fiction is about individuals broken from family. The closest they come to satisfying the universal yearning is a struggle for the surrogates, like the strange connection between Pearl, Hester, and the Dark Forest. America's most fascinating storytellers focus on the hollowness of American public life. We have no place to go when work is done. Our inner life is long extinguished. Our public work in remaking the world can never be done because personal homework isn't available to us. There's no institutional solace for this malady. In outrage at our lonely fate, we lay siege to the family sanctuary wherever it survives as Ahab lay siege to the seas for his accursed whale. For this and other reasons long lost, I decided to teach Moby Dick to my 8th graders, including the dumb ones. I discovered right away the white whale was just too big for 45-minute bell breaks. I couldn't divide it comfortably to fit the schedule. Melville's book is too vast to say just what the right way to teach it really is. It speaks to every reader privately. To grapple with it demanded elastic time, not the fixed bell breaks of junior high. Indeed, it offered so many choices of purpose, some aesthetic, 
some historical, some social, some philosophical, some theological, some dramatic, some economic, that compelling the attention of a room full of young people to any one aspect seemed willful and arbitrary. Soon after I began teaching Moby Dick, I realized the school edition wasn't a real book, but a kind of disguised indoctrination, providing all the questions, a scientific addition to the original text designed to make the book teacher-proof and student-proof. If you even read those questions, let alone answer them, there would be no chance ever again for a private exchange between you and Melville. The invisible editor would have preempted it. The editors of the school edition provided a package of prefabricated questions and more than a hundred chapter-by-chapter abstracts and interpretations of their own. The editors of the school edition provided a package of prefabricated questions and more than a hundred chapter-by-chapter abstracts and interpretations of their own. Many teachers considered this a gift. It does the thinking for them. If I didn't assign these questions, kids wanted to know why not. Their parents wanted to know why not. Unless everyone duly parroted the party line set down by the book editor, children used to getting children used to getting high marks became scared and angry. The school text of Moby Dick had been subtly denatured, worse than useless. It was actually dangerous. So I pitched it out and bought a set of undoctored books with my own money. The school edition of Moby Dick asked all the right questions, so I had to throw it away. Real books don't do that. Real books demand people actively participate by asking their own questions. Books that will show you the best questions to ask aren't just stupid. They hurt the mind under the guise of helping it, exactly the way standardized tests do. Real books, unlike school books, can't be standardized. They are eccentric. No books fit for everyone. If you think about it, schooled people, like school books, are much alike. Some folks find that desirable for economic reasons. The discipline organizing our economy and our politics derives from mathematical and interpretive exercises, the accuracy of which depends upon customers being much alike and very predictable. People who read too many books get quirky. We can't have too much eccentricity or it would bankrupt us. Market research depends on people behaving as if they were alike. It doesn't really matter whether they are or not. One way to see the difference between school books and real books like Moby Dick is to examine different procedures which separate librarians, the custodians of real books, from school teachers, the custodians of school books. To begin with, libraries are usually comfortable, clean, and quiet. They are orderly places where you can actually read instead of just pretending to read. For some reason, libraries are never age segregated, nor do they presume to segregate readers by questionable tests of ability, any more than farms or forests or, ocean, or oceans do. The librarian doesn't tell me what to read, doesn't tell me what sequence of reading I have to follow, doesn't grade my reading. The librarian trusts me to have a worthwhile purpose of my own. I appreciate that and trust the library in return. Some other significant differences between libraries and schools. The librarian lets me ask my own questions and helps me when I want help, not when she decides I need it. If I feel like reading all day long, that's okay with a librarian who doesn't compel me to stop at intervals by ringing a bell in my ear. The library keeps it, its nose out of my home. It doesn't send letters to my family, nor does it issue orders on how I should use my reading time at home. The library doesn't play favorites. It's a, it's a democratic place, as seems proper in a democracy. If the books I want are available, I get them, even if that decision deprives someone more gifted and talented than I am. The library never humiliates me by posting ranked lists of good readers. It presumes good reader reading is its own reward and doesn't need to be held up as an object lesson to bad readers. One of the strangest differences between a library and a school is that you almost never see a kid behaving badly in a library. The library never makes predictions about my future based on my past reading habits. It tolerates eccentric reading because it realizes free men and women are often very eccentric. Finally, the library has real books, not school books. I know the Moby Dick I find in the library won't have questions at the end of the chapter 
or be scientifically boulderized. Library books are not written by collective pens, at least not yet. Real books conform to the private curriculum of each author, not to the invisible curriculum of a corporate bureaucracy. Real books transport us to an inner realm of solitude and unmonitor mental reflection in a way school books and computer programs can't. If they were not devoid of such capacity, they would jeopardize school routines devised to control behavior. Real books conform to the private curriculum of particular authors, not to the demands of bureaucracy. Intellectual Espionage At the start of World War II, millions of men showed up at the registration offices to take low-level academic tests before being inducted. The years of maximum mobilization were 1942 to 1944. The fighting force had been mostly schooled in the 1930s. Both those inducted and those turned away. Of the 18 million men were tested, 17,280,000 of them were judged to have had the minimum competence in reading required to be a soldier, a 96% literacy rate. Although this was a 2% fall off from the 98% rate among voluntary military applicants 10 years earlier, the dip was so small it didn't worry anybody. World War II was over in 1945. Six years later, another war began in Korea. Several million men were tested for military service, but this time, 600,000 were rejected. Literacy in the draft pool had dropped to 81%, even though all that was needed to classify a soldier as literate was fourth grade reading proficiency. In the few short years from the beginning of World War II to Korea, a terrifying problem of adult illiteracy had appeared. The Korean War Group received most of its schooling in the 1940s. It had more years in school with more professionally trained personnel and more scientifically selected textbooks than the World War II men. Yet it could not read, write, count, speak, or think as well as earlier, less school-minded contingent. contingent. A third American war began in the mid-1960s. By its end in 1973, the number of men found non-inductible by the reason of inability to read, safety, instructions, interpret road signs, decipher orders, and so on. In other words, the number found illiterate had reached 27% of the total pool. Vietnam-era young men had been schooled in the 1950s and the 60s, much better schooled than either of the two earlier groups. But the 4% illiteracy of 1941 which had transmuted into 19% illiteracy of 1952, had now grown into the 27% illiteracy of 1970. Not only had the fraction of competent readers dropped to 73%, but a substantial chunk of even those were only barely adequate. They could not keep abreast of developments by reading a newspaper. They could not read for pleasure. They could not sustain a thought or an argument. They could not write well enough to manage their own affairs without assistance. Consider how much more compelling this steady progression of intellectual blindness is when we track it through army admission tests rather than college admission scores and standardized reading tests, which inflate apparent proficiency by frequently changing the way the tests are scored. Looking back, abundant data exists from states like Connecticut and Massachusetts to show that by 1840, the incidence of complex literacy in the United States was between 93 and 100 percent, wherever such a thing matter, ma mattered. According to the Connecticut census of 1840, only one citizen out of every 579 was illiterate. And you probably don't want to know, not really, what people in those days considered literate. It's too embarrassing. Popular novels of the period give a clue. Last of the Mohicans, published in 1826, sold so well that a contemporary equivalent would have to move 10 million copies to match it. If you pick up an uncut version, you find yourself in a dense thicket of philosophy, history, cultures, manners, politics, geography, analysis of human motives and actions, all conveyed in a data-rich periodic. Sentences so formidable, only a determined and well-educated reader can handle it nowadays. Yet in 1818, we were a small, small farm nation 
without colleges or universities to speak of, could those simple folk have had more complex minds than our own? By, 18, by 1940, the literacy figure for all states stood at 96% for whites, 80% for blacks. Notice that for all the disadvantages blacks labored under, four of five were nevertheless literate. Six decades later, at the end of the 20th century, the National Adult Literacy Survey and the National Assessment of Educational Progress say 40% of blacks and 17% of whites can't read at all. Put another way, black illiteracy doubled, white illiteracy quadrupled. Before you think of anything else in regard to these numbers, think of this. We spend three to four times as much real money on schooling as we did 60 years ago. But 60 years ago, virtually everyone, black or white, could read. In their famous bestseller, The Bell Curve, prominent social analysts Charles Murray and Richard Hernstein say that what we're seeing are the results of selective breeding in society. Smart people naturally get together with smart people, dumb people with dumb people. As they have children generation after generation, the differences between the groups gets larger and larger. That sounds plausible, and the authors produce impressive mathematics to prove their case, but their documentation shows that they are entirely ignorant of the military data available to challenge their contention. The terrifying drop in literacy between World War II and Korea happened in a decade. Even the brashest survival of the fittest theorists wouldn't argue evolution unfolds this way. The bell curve writers say black illiteracy and violence is genetically programmed. But like many academics, they ignore contradictory evidence. For example, on the matter of violence inscribed in black genes, the inconvenient parallel is to South Africa, where 31 million blacks live, the same count living in the United States. Compare numbers of blacks who died by violence in South Africa in civil war conditions during 1989, 1990, and 91 with our own peacetime mortality statistics, and you find that far more exceeding the violent death toll in the United States, or you find that far from exceeding the violent death toll in the United States, or even matching it, South Africa had proportionately less than one quarter the violent death rate of American blacks. If more contemporary comparisons are sought, we need only to compare the current black literacy rate in the United States, which is 56%, with the rate in Jamaica at 98.5% a figure considerably higher than the American white literacy rate at 83%. If not heredity, what then? Well, one change is indisputable, well-documented, and easy to track. During World War II, American public schools massively converted to a non-phonetic way of teaching reading. On the matter of violence alone, this would not seem to have an impact. According to the Justice Department, 80% of the incarcerated violent criminal population is illiterate, or nearly so, and 67% of all criminals locked up. There seems to be a direct connection between the humiliation poor readers experience and the life of angry criminals. As reading ability plummeted in America after World War II, crime soared. So did out-of-wedlock births, which doubled in the 1950s and doubled again in the 1960s, when bizarre violence for the first time became commonplace in daily life. When literacy was first abandoned as a primary goal by schools, white people were in a better position than black people because they inherited a 300-year-old American tradition of learning to read at home by matching spoken sounds with letters. Thus, home assistance was able to correct the deficiencies of dumbed-down schools for whites. But black people had been forbidden to learn to read under slavery, and as late as 1930 only averaged three to four years of schooling. So they were helpless when teachers suddenly stopped teaching children to read, since they had no fallback position. Not helpless because of genetic inferiority, but because they had to trust school authorities to a much greater extent than white people. Back in 1952, the Army quietly began hiring hundreds of psychologists to find out how 600,000 high school graduates had successfully faked illiteracy. Regina Wood sums up the episode this way. After the psychologist told the officers that the graduates weren't faking, the Defense Department administrators knew that something terrible had happened in grade school reading instruction. 
and they knew it had started in the 30s. Why they remained silent? No one knows. The switch back to reading instruction that worked for everyone should have been made then, but it wasn't. In 1882, fifth grade fifth graders read these authors in their Appleton School Reader, William Shakespeare, Henry Thoreau, George Washington, Sir Walter Scott, Mark Twain, Benjamin Franklin, Oliver Wendell Holmes, John Bunyan, Daniel Webster, Samuel Johnson, Lewis Carroll, Thomas Jefferson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and others like them. In 1995, a student teacher of fifth graders in Minneapolis wrote to the local newspaper, I was told children are not expected to spell the following words correctly. Back, big, call, came, can, day, did, dog, down, get, good, have, he, home, if, in, its, like, little, man, morning, mother, my, night, off, out, over, people, play, ran, said, saw, she, some, soon, there, them, their time, two, two, up, us, very, water, we, went, where, when, will, would, etc. Is this nuts? Looking behind the appearance. Looking behind appearances. Do you think class size, teacher compensation, and school revenue have much to do with educational quality? If so, the conclusion is inescapable that we're living in a golden age. From 1955 to 1991, the U.S. pupil teacher ratio dropped 40%. The average salary of a teacher rose 50% in real terms. The annual expenses per pupil, inflation adjusted, soared 350%. What are their hypothesis then? Might fit the strange data I'm about to present. Forget the 10% drop in SAT and achievement test scores. The press beats to death with regularity. How do you explain the 37% decline since 1972 in students who score above 600 on the SAT? This is an absolute decline, not a relative one. It is not affected by an increase in unsuitable minds taking the test or by an increase in the numbers. The absolute body count of smart students is down drastically, with the test not more difficult than yesterday's, but considerably less so. What should be made of a 50% decline among the rarefied group of test takers who score above the 750. In 1972, there were 2,817 American students who reached this pinnacle. Only 1,438 did in 1994. When kids took a much easier test, can a 50% decline occur in 22 years without signaling that some massive leveling in the public school mind is underway? In a real sense, when your own child is concerned, in a real sense, where your own child is concerned, you might best forget so gores on these tests entirely as reliable measure of what they purport to assess. I wouldn't deny that mass movements in these scores in one direction or another indicate something is going on. And since correlation between success in schooling and success on these test scores is close, then significant score shifts are certainly measuring changes in understanding. This is a difficult matter for anyone to sort out, since many desirable occupational categories and desirable university seats, even before that, are reserved for those who score well. The resultant linkage of adult income with test scores then creates the illusion these tests are separating cream from milk. But the results are rigged in advance by foreclosing opportunity to those screened out by the test. In a humble illustration, if you only let students with high scores on the language component of the SATs cut hair, eventually it would appear that verbal faculty and grooming of tresses has some vital link with each other. Between 1960 and 1998, the non-teaching bureaucracy of public schools grew 500%, but oversight was concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. The 40,520 school districts with elected boards this nation had in 1960 shriveled to 15,000 by 1998. On the college rung of the school ladder, something queer was occurring too. Between 1960 and 1984, the quality of undergraduate education at America's 50 best-known colleges and universities altered substantially. 
According to a 1996 report by the National Association of Scholars, these schools stopped providing broad and rigorous exposure to major areas of knowledge. For the average student, even at decidedly unaverage universities like Yale or Stanford, in 1964, more than half of these institutions required a thesis or comprehensive for the bachelor's degree. By 1993, 12% did. Over the same period, the average number of classroom days fell by 16%, and the requirements in math, natural science, philosophy, literature, composition, and history almost vanished. Rhetoric, most potent for the act of literacies, completely vanished, and a foreign language, once required at 96% of the great colleges, fell to 64%. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, December of 1995, 33% of all patients cannot read and understand instructions on how often to take medication, notices about doctor's appointments, consent forms, labels on prescription bottles, insurance forms, and other simple parts of self-care. They are rendered helpless by inability to read. Concerning those behind the nation's prison walls, a population that has tripled since 1980, the National Center for Educational Statistics stated in a 1996 report that 80% of all prisoners could not interpret a bus schedule, understand a news article, or warranty instructions, or read maps, schedules, or payroll forms, nor could they balance a checkbook. 40% could not calculate the cost of a purchase. Once upon a time, we were a new nation that allowed ordinary citizens to learn to read well and encouraged them to read anything they thought would be useful. Close reading of tough-minded writing is the best, cheapest, and quickest method known for learning to think for yourself. This invitation to commoners extended by America was the most revolutionary pedagogy of all. Reading and rigorous discussion of that reading in a way that obliges you to formulate a position and support it against objections is an operational definition of education in its most fundamental civilized sense. No one can do this very well without learning ways of paying attention. From a knowledge of dictation and syntax, figures of speech, etymology, and so on, to a sharp ability to separate the primary from the subordinate, understand illusion, master a range of modes of presentation, test truths, and penetrate beyond the obvious to the profound message of the text. Reading Analysis and discussion are the way we develop reliable judgment, the principal way we come to penetrate covert moments, covert movements behind the facade of public appearances. Without the ability to read and argue, we're just geese to be plucked. Just as experience is necessary to understand abstraction, so the reverse is true. Experience can only be mastered by extracting general principles out of the mass of details. In the absence of a perfect universal mentor, books and other texts are the best and cheapest stand-ins always available to those who know where to look. Watching details of an assembly line or a local election unfold isn't very educational unless you've been led in careful ways to analyze the experience. Reading is the skeleton key for all who lack a personal tutor of quality. Reading teaches nothing more important than the state of mind in which you find yourself absolutely alone with the thoughts of another mind, a matchless form of intimate rapport available only to those with the ability to block out distraction and concentrate, hence the urgency of reading well. If you read for power, once you trust yourself to go mind to mind with great intellects, artists, scientists, warriors, and philosophers, you're finally free. In America, before we had forced schooling, an astonishing range of unlikely people knew reading was like Samson's locks, something that could help make them formidable, that could teach them their rights and how to defend those rights could lead towards self, them towards self-determination, free from intimidation by experts. These same unlikely people knew that the power bestowed through reading could give them insight into the ways of the human heart so they would not be cheated or fooled easily, and that they, it could provide an inexhaustible store of useful knowledge 
advice on how to do just about anything. In 1812, Pierre de Pont was claiming that barely four in a thousand Americans were unable to read well and that the young had skill in argumentation thanks to daily debates at the common breakfast table. By 1820, there were even more evidence of Americans' avid reading habits when five million copies of James Fenimore's Cooper's Complex and elusive novels were sold, along with an equal number of Noah Webster's didactic, didactic speller to a population of dirt farmers under 20 million in size. In 1835, Richard Cobden announced there was six times as much newspaper reading in the United States as in England, and the census figures of 1840 gave fairly exact evidence that a sensational reading revolution had taken place without any exhortation on the part of public moralists and social workers. Not because common people had the, in but because the common people had the initiative and freedom to learn. In North Carolina, the worst situation of any state surveyed, eight out of nine could still read and write. In 1853, per Per Stellestrom, a Swedish visitor, wrote, In no country in the world is the taste for reading so diffuse as among the common people in America. The American Almanac observed grandly, Periodical publications, especially newspapers, disseminate knowledge throughout all classes of society and exert an amazing influence in forming and giving effect to public opinion. It noted the existence of over a thousand newspapers, in this nation of common readers, the spiritual longings of ordinary people shaped the public discourse. Ordinary people who could read, though not privileged by wealth, power, or position, could see through the fraud of social class or the ever grander fraud of official expertise. That was the trouble. In his book, The New Illiterates, author Sam Blunenfeld gives us the best introduction to what went wrong with reading in the United States. He also gives us insight into why learning to read needn't be frustrating or futile. A typical letter from one of his readers boasts of her success in imparting the alphabet code to her four children under the age of five by the simple me method of practice with letter sounds. One day she found her three-year-old working his way through a lesson alone at the kitchen table reading S. Am, Sam, M, Ann, Man, and so on. Her verdict on the process. I had just taught him his letter sounds. He picked up the rest and did it himself. That's how simple it is. The Sudbury Valley School. I know a school for kids ages 13, 3 to 18 that doesn't teach anybody to read. Yet everyone who goes there learns to do it. Most very well. It's the beautiful Sudbury Valley School, 20 miles west of Boston in the old Nathaniel Bowditch Cottage, which looks suspiciously like a mansion, a place ringed by handsome outbuildings, a private lake, woods, and acres of magnificent ground. Sudbury is a private school, but with a tuition under $4,000 a year. It's considerably cheaper than a seat in the New York City public school. At Sudbury, kids teach themselves to read. They learn at many different ages, even into the teen years, though that's rare. When each kid is ready, he or she self-instructs. If such a formal label is inappropriate for such a natural undertaking, during this time, they are free to request as much adult assistance as needed. That usually isn't much. In 30 years of operation, Sudbury has never had a single kid who didn't learn to read. All this aided by a magnificent school library, on open shelves where books are borrowed and returned on the honor system. About 65% of Sudbury kids go on to good colleges. The place has never seen a case of dyslexia. That's not to say some kids don't reverse letters and such from time to time, but such conditions are temporary and self-correcting unless institutionalized into a disease. So Sudbury doesn't even teach reading. Yet all its kids learn to read and even like reading. What could be going on there that we don't understand? Booty Zimmer. The miracle woman who taught me to read was my mother, Booty. Booty never got a college degree, but nobody despaired about that because daily life went right along then without too many college graduates. Here was Booty's scientific method. She would hold me on her lap 
and read to me while she ran her finger under the words. That was it. Except to read always with a lively expression, a lively expression in her voice and eyes to answer my questions and from time to time to give me some practice with letter sounds. One thing more important, for a long time we would sing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and so on every single day. We learned to love each letter. We would read tough stories as well as easy ones. The truth is, I don't think she could readily tell the difference any more than I could. The books had some pictures, but only a few. Words made up the center of attention. Pictures have nothing at all to do with learning to love reading, except too many of them will pretty much guarantee that it never happens. Over 50 years ago, my mother, Booty Zimmer, chose to teach me to read well. She had no degrees, no government salary, no outside encouragement, yet her private choice to make a reader was my passport to a good and adventurous life. Booty, the daughter of a Bavarian printer, said, nuts to the Prussian system. She voted for her own right to decide, and for that I will always be in her debt. She gave me a love of language, and it didn't cost much. Anybody could have the same if schooling hadn't abandoned its duty so flagrantly. False premises. The religious purpose of modern schooling was announced clearly by the legendary University of Wisconsin sociologist Edward A. Ross in 1901 in his famous book, Social Control. Your librarian should be able to locate a copy for you without much trouble. In it, Ed Ross wrote these words for his prominent following. Plans are underway to replace community, family, and church with propaganda, education, and mass media. The state shakes loose from church, reaches out to school. People are not are only little plastic lumps of human dough. Social control revolutionized the discipline of sociology and had powerful effects on other human sciences. In social science, it guided the direction of a political science, economics, and psychology. In biology, it influenced genetics, eugenics, and psychobiology. It played a critical role in the conception and design of molecular biology. There you have it in a nutshell. The whole problem with modern schooling it rests on a nest of false premises. People are not like little plastic lumps of dough. They are not blank tablets as John Locke said they were. They are not machines as De Lemaitre hoped. Not vegetables as Friedrich Froebel, inventor of kindergartens, hypothesized. Not organic mechanisms as William Bunt taught every psychology department in America at the turn of the century nor are they repertoires of behavior as Watson and Skinner wanted. They are not, as the new crop of system thinkers would have it, mystically harmonious microsystems interlocking with grand macrosystems in a dance of atomic forces. I don't want to be crazy about this. Locked in a lecture hall or a bowl session, there's probably no more harm in these theories than reading too many Italian sonnets all at one sitting. But when each of these suppositions is sprung free, to serve as foundation for school experiments, it leads to frightfully oppressive practices. One of the ideas that empty child thinking led directly to was the, non, was the notion that human breeding could be enhanced or retarded as a plant and animal breeding was by scientific gardeners and husbandmen. Of course, the timescale over which this was plotted to happen was quite long. Nobody expected it to be like breeding fruit flies, but it was a major academic, governmental, and even military item generously funded until Hitler's proactive program, following America's lead, grew so embarrassing by 1939 that our own projects and plans were made more circumspect. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, the monstrously influential Edward Thorndike of Columbia Teacher Colleges said that school would establish conditions, quote, for selective breeding before the masses take things into their own hands, end quote. The religious purpose of modern schooling was embarrassingly evident back when Ross and Thorndike were on center stage, but they were surrounded by many like-minded friends. Another major architect of standardized testing, H.H. H. Goddard, 
wrote in his book, Human Efficiency in 1920, that government schooling was about the perfect organization of the hive. He said standardized testing was a way to make lower classes recognize their own inferiority, like wearing a dunce cap. It would discourage them from breeding and having ambition. Goddard was the head of the psychology department at Princeton. So imagine the effect he had on the minds of doctoral candidates he coached. And there were hundreds. We didn't leave the religious purpose of modern schooling back in the early years of the cent- of this century. In 1996, Al Shanker of the AFT said in his regular New York Times split page advertisement that every teacher was really a priest. A system of state propaganda. Something strange is going on in schools and has been going on for quite some time. Whatever it is does not arise from the main American traditions. As closely as I can track the thing through the attitudes, practices, and stated goals of the shadowy crew who makes a good living skulking around educational laboratories, think tanks, and foundations, we are, we are experiencing an attempt, successful so far, to reimpose the strong state, strong social class attitudes of Germany and England. On the United States, the very attitudes we threw off in the American Revolution and in this counter-revolution, the state of churches of England and Germany have been replaced by the secular church of forced government schooling, advertising, public relations, and stronger forms of quasi-religious propaganda are so pervasive in our schools, even in alternative schools, that independent judgment is suffocated in mass-produced secondary experiences and market-tested initiatives. Lifetime Learning Systems, one of the many new corporations formed to dig gold from our conditions of schooling, announced to its corporate clients, quote, School is the ideal time to influence attitudes, build long-term loyalties, introduce new products, test market, promote samplings and trial usage, and above all, to generate immediate sales, end quote. Arnold Toneby, the establishment's favorite historian in mid-20th century America, said in his monumental study of history that the original promise of universal education had been destroyed as soon as the school laws were passed, a destruction caused by the possibility of turning education to account as a means of amusement for the masses and a means of profit for the enterprising persons by whom the amusement is purveyed. This opportunistic conversion quickly followed mass schooling's introduction when fantastic profit potential set powerful forces into motion. The bread of universal education is no sooner cast upon the water than a shoal of sharks arises from the depths and devours the children's bread under the educator's very eyes. In Toneby's analysis, the dates speak for themselves. The edifice of universal education was roughly speaking completed in 1870 and the yellow press was invented 20 years later. As soon that is as the first generation of children from the national schools had acquired sufficient purchasing power by a stroke of irresponsible genius, which had divined that the educate educational labor of love could be made to yield a royal profit. But vultures attending the inception of forced compulsion schooling attracted more ferocious predators. The commercial institutions that set about at once to prey on forced mass schooling attracted the attention of the rulers of modern national states. If press lords could make millions but by providing idle amusement for the half-educated, serious statements, statesmen could draw, not money perhaps, but power from the same source. The modern dictators had deposed the press lords and substituted for crude and debased private entertainment an equally crude and debased system of state propaganda. The Ideology of the Text Looking back on the original period of school formation in her study of American history textbook, America Revised, Frances Fitzgerald remarked on the profound changes that emerged following suggestions issued by sociologists and social thinkers in the late 19th century and early 20th century. The original history of our institutions and the documents 
which protect our unique li liberties, gradually began to be effaced. Fitzgerald raises the puzzle of textbook alteration. The ide ideology that lies behind these texts is rather difficult to define. It does not fit usual political patterns. The texts never indicate any line of actions. Authors avoid what they chose to, and some of them avoid main issues. They fail to develop any original ideas. They confuse social sciences with science. Clouds of jargon leave out ideas. Historical names are given. No character. They are cipher people. There are no conflicts, only problems. Indeed, the text may be unfathomable, and that may be the editorial intent. The National Adult Literacy Survey. In 1982, Anthony Ottenberg, a member of the private discussion group called the Council on Foreign Relations, asked an audience communications executives this question. Do we really have to have everybody literate? Writing and reading in the traditional sense, when we have means through our technology to achieve a new flowering of oral communication. Ortinger suggests our idea of literacy is obsolete. 83 years earlier, John Dewey had written in the primary education fetish that the plea for the predominance of learning to read in early school life because of the great importance attaching to literature seems to be a perversion. For the balance of this discussion, I'm going to step into deeper water, first reviewing what reading in a Western alphabet really means and what makes it reasonably easy skill to transmit or to self-teach, and then tackling what happened to deprive the ordinary person of the ability to manage it very well. I want to first show you how, then answer the more speculative question of why. The National Adult Literacy Survey represents 190 million U.S. adults over the age of 16 with an average attendance of 12.4 years. The survey is conducted by the Educational Testing Service of Princeton, New Jersey. It ranks adult Americans into five levels. Here is the 1993 analysis. 42 million Americans over the age of 16 can't read. Some of this group can write their names on social security cards and fill in weight, height, and birthplaces on application forms. 50 million can recognize printed words on a fourth or fifth grade level. They cannot write simple messages or letters. 55 to 60 million are limited to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade reading. A majority of this group could not figure out the price per ounce of peanut butter in a 20 ounce jar costing $1.99 when they were told they could round the answer off to a whole number. Four, 30 million have ninth and 10th grade reading proficiency. This group and all proceeding cannot understand a simplified explanation of the procedures used by attorneys and judges in selecting juries. About 3.5% of the 26,000 member sample demonstrated literacy schools adequate to traditional college study. A level 30% of all U.S. high school students reached in 1940, in which 30% of secondary students in other developed countries can reach today. This last fact alone should warn you how misleading comparisons drawn from international student competitions really are, since the samples each country sends are small elite ones, unrepresentative of the entire student population. But behind the bogus superiority, a real one is concealed. 96.5% of the American population is mediocre to illiterate, where deciphering print is concerned. This is no commentary on their intelligence, but without ability to take in primary information from print and to interpret it, that they are at the mercy of commentators who tell them what things mean. A working definition of immaturity might include an excessive need for other people to interpret information for us. Certainly, it's possible to argue about bad readers aren't victims at all, but perpetrators cursed by inferior biology to possess only shadows of intellect. That's what the bell curve theory, evolutionary theory, aristocratic social theory, eugenics theory, strong state political theory, and some kinds of theology are about. All agree most of us are inferior, if not downright dangerous. The integrity of such theoretical outlooks, at least where reading was concerned, took a stiff shot on the chin from America. Here, democratic practice allowed a revolutionary generation to learn how to read. 
Those granted the opportunity took advantage of it brilliantly. Name sounds, not things. So how was the murder of Americans' reading ability pulled off? I'll tell you in a second, but come back first to the classical Greece where the stupendous invention of the alphabet by Phoenicians was initially understood. The Phoenicians had an alphabetic language used to keep accounts, but the Greeks were the first to guess correctly that the revolutionary power could be unleashed by transcending mere lists, using written language for the permanent storage of analysis, exhortation, visions, and other things. After a period of experiment, the Greeks came up with a series of letters to represent sounds of their language. Like the Phoenicians, they recognized the value of naming each letter in a way that was distinct from his or her personality, as numbers have names for reference. Naming sounds rather than things was the breakthrough. While the number of things to be pictured is impossibly large, the number of sounds is strictly limited. In English, for example, most people recognize only 44. The problem which American families once largely solved for themselves is this. In English, a Latin alphabet has been imposed on a Germanic language with multiple non-Germanic borrowings, and it doesn't quite fit. Our 44 sounds are spelled 400 different ways. That sounds horrible, but in reality, in the hands of even a mediocre teacher, it's only annoying. In the hands of a good one, it's a thrilling challenge. Actually, 85% of the vast word stock of English can be read with knowledge of only 70 of the phonograms. A large number of the remaining irregularities seldom occurs and can be remastered on an as-needed basis. Meanwhile, a whole armory of mnemonic tricks like if a C I chance to spy, place the E before the I exist to get new readers over the common humps. Inexpensive dictionaries, spell check typewriters, computers, and other technology are readily available these days to silently coach the fearful. But in my experience, that fear is neither warranted nor natural. Instead, it is engendered. Call it good business practice. Also, communicating abstractions in picture language is a subtly is subtility requiring more time and training to master than is available for most of us. Greeks could not organize ambitious concepts abstractly in written language, communicating accurately with each other over space and time much more readily than their competitors. According to Mitford Matthews, the secret of their phenomenal advance was in their conception of the nature of a word. They reasoned that words were sounds or combinations of ascertainable sounds, and they held inexplorably to the basic proposition that writing properly executed was a guide to sound reading. Learning sight-sound correspondences comes first in an alphabetic language. Competence with the entire package of sounds corresponding to alphabet symbol comes quickly. After that, anything can be read and its meaning inquired after. The substantial speaking vocabulary kids bring to school, six to 10,000 words, can now be read at once and understood. When the Romans got the alphabet through the Etruscans, they lost the old letter names, so they invented new ones, making them closer to the letter sounds. That was a significant mistake, which causes confusion in novice readers even today. Through conquest, the Latin alphabet spread to the languages of Europe. Rome's later mutation into the universal Christian church caused Latin, the language of church liturgy, to flow into every nook and cranny of the former empire. The Latin alphabet was applied to the English language by Christian missionaries in the 7th century. While it fused with spoken English, this was far from a perfect fit. There was no single letters to stand for certain sounds. Scribes had to scramble to combine letters to approximate sounds that had no companion letter. This matching process was complicated over centuries by repeated borrowings from other languages and by certain massive sound shifts which still occupy scholars in, the, in trying to explain. Before the spread of printing in the 16th century, not being able to read wasn't much of a big deal. There wasn't much to read. The principal volume available was the Bible, from which appropriate bits were read aloud by religious authorities during worship and on ceremonial occasions. 
Available texts were in Latin and Greek, but persistent attempts to provide translations was a practice thought to contain much potential for schism. An official English Bible, the authorized King James Version, appeared in 1611, preempting all competitors in a bold stroke which changed popular destiny. Instantly, the Bible became a universal textbook offering insights both delicate and powerful. A vibrant cast of characters, brilliant verbal pyrotechnics, and more to the humble rascal who could read. Talk about a revolutionary awakening for ordinary people. The Bible was it. Thanks to the dazzling range of models, it provided the areas of exegesis, drama, politics, psychology, characterization, plus the formidable reading skills it took to grapple with the Bible. A little more than three decades after this translation, the English king was deposed and beheaded. The connection was direct. Nothing would ever be the same again because too many good readers had acquired the proclivity of thinking for themselves. The magnificent enlargement of imagination and voice that the Bible's exceptional catalog of language and ideas made available awakened in ordinary people a powerful desire to read in order to read the holy book without a priest's mediation. Strenuous efforts were made to discourage this, but the Puritan Revolution and Cromwell's interrogum sent literacy surging. Nowhere was it so accelerated as in the British colonies in North America, a place already far removed from the royal voice. Printing technology emerged, like the computer in our own day. It was quickly incorporated into every corner of life but there were still frequent jailings, whippings, and confiscations for seditious reading as people of substance came to realize how dangerous literacy could be. Reading offered many delights, cravings to satisfy curiosity about this Shakespeare fellow or to dabble in the musings of Lord Bacon or John Locke were now not too difficult to satisfy. Spelling and layout were made consistent. Before long, prices of books dropped. All this activity intensified pressure of illiterate in individuals to become literate. The net result of printing and Protestantism, which urged communicants to go directly to the word, eliminating the priestly middlemen, stimulated the spread of roving teachers in small proprietary and school churches. A profession arose to satisfy demand for a popular way to understand what uses to make of books, and from this demand to understand many things. The Meat Grinder Classroom The first schoolman to seriously challenge what is to known today as phonics was Frederick Gedeiki, a discipline of Rousseau, a director of a well-known gymnasium in Prussia. In 1791, he published the world's first look-say primer, a children's reader without the ABCs and spelling. The idea was to eliminate drill. Kids would learn through pictures following suggestions. The legendary mystic and scholar Camonius set down in his famous Orbis Pictus of 1657. After a brief splash in three editions, the fashion vanished for an excellent reason. As good as it sounds in theory, it doesn't work at all in practice. Although here and there exceptions are encountered, and infuriatingly enough, it can seem to work in the early years of first and second grade. Soon after that, the rapidly developing reading power in phonetically chained trilled children makes them capable of recognizing in print their entire speaking and listening vocabulary, while look and say trained readers can read without error only the words they've memorized as whole shapes, a relative handful. This is devis, devilishly complex terrain. Gedeiki's theory held that when enough words are ingested and recognized, the student can figure out for himself the 70 key phonograms of the English language. Indeed, this is only credible explanation, which could account for the well-known phenomenon of children who teach themselves to read handily without the use of any system at all. I have no doubt children occasionally learn to read this way, yet if true, how do we account for the grotesque record of the whole world instruction for over a century and half in every conceivable school setting? Money, 
time, attention, and caring adults in profusion all have been available to make this alternative method work to teach reading proficiency, yet its record in competition with old-fashioned alphabet system is horrifying. What might account for this? I have a hunch based on a decade of ruminating, since no one has yet bothered to assemble a large group of self-taught good readers to ask them how it happened. Yet my hunch serve as working hypothesis for you to chew upon at your leisure. Consider first the matter of time. The average five-year-old can master all of the 70 phonograms in six weeks, at what point he can read just about anything fluently. But can he understand everything? No, of course not. But also, no synthetic barrier to understanding is being interposed by weird-looking words to be memorized whole either. Paul Freire taught ignorant compensios with no tradition of literacy at all to read in 30 hours. They were adults with different motivations than children, but when he showed them a sentence, they realized it said, the land belongs to the tiller. They were hooked. That's Jesuit savvy for you. Back to this matter of time. By the end of the fourth grade, phonics trained students are at ease with an estimated 24,000 words. Whole word trained students have memorized about 1,600 words and can successfully guess at a thousand more, but unsuccessfully guess at thousands too. One reigning whole world ex whole word expert has called reading a psycholinguistic guessing game, in which the reader is not extracting the writer's meaning, but constructing a meaning of his own. While there's an attractive side to this that is ignored by critics of whole language, and I number myself among these, the value doesn't begin to atone for the theft of priceless reading time and guided practice. As long as whole language kids are retained in a hot house environment, shielded from linguistic competition, things seem idyllic. But once mixed together with phonetically trained kids of similar age and asked to avail themselves of the intellectual treasure locked up in words, the rest, the result is not so pretty. Either the deficient kid must retreat from the field with a whooping sense of inferiority, or he must advance aggressively into the fray, claiming books are overrated, that thinking and judgment are merely matters of opinion. The awful truth is that circumstances hardly give us the luxury of testing Gadaiki's hypothesis about kids being able to deduce the rules of language from a handful of words. Humiliation makes mincemeat of most of them long before the trial is fairly joined. So the second hunch I have here is that where whole word might be, might work when it works at all, it is an uncomfortable, protected environment. So the second hunch I have is that where whole word might work when it works at all, it's in a comfortable, protected environment without people around to laugh derisively at so many wretched mistakes you make on the way to becoming a Columbus of language. But in case you haven't noticed, schools aren't safe places for the young to guess at the meanings of things. Only an imbecile would pretend that school isn't a pressure cooker of psychodrama. Wherever children are gathered into groups by compulsion, a pecking order soon emerges in which malice, mockery, intimidation of the weak, envy, and a whole range of other nasty characteristics hold sway, like that famous mill pond of Huxley's, whose quiet surface mirroring fall foliage conceals a murderous subterranean world whose law is eat or be eaten. That's melodramatic, I suppose, yet... 30 classroom years and a decade more as a visitor in hundreds of other schools have shown me what a meat grinder the peaceful classroom really is. Bill is wondering whether he will be beaten again on the way to the lunchroom. Molly is paralyzed with fear that the popular Jean would make loud fun of her prominent teeth. Ronald is digging the point of a sharpened pencil into the neck of Herbert, who sits in front of him, all the while whispering he will get herb if gerb if he gets Ron in trouble with the teacher. Alan is snapping a rubber band at Flo. Ralph is about to call Leonard pa Trailer Park Trash for the 300th time that day. Not completely clear that he knows what it means, yet enjoying the anguish it brings to Leonard's face. Greta, the most beautiful girl in the room, is practicing oogling Shire boys. 
then cutting them dead when she evokes any hopeful smile in response. Willie is slowly shaken down for a dollar by Phil, and Mary's single mom just received an eviction notice. Welcome to another day in an orderly scientific classroom. Teacher may have a permanent simper pasted on her face, but it's deadly serious. The world she presides over, a bad place to play psycholinguistic guessing games, which involves sticking one's neck out in the front of the classmates as the rule of language are empirically derived. A method that finds mistakes to be charming, stabs in the right direction, may be onto something person to person or in the environment of a loving home, but it's dynamically unsuited to the forge of forced schooling. The Ignorant Schoolmaster after Gedeiki, the next innovator to hit on a reading scheme was Jean Joseph Jacotat, a grand genius, much misunderstood. A professor of literature at 19, Jacotat discovered a method of teaching non speakers of French the French language, beginning not with primers but with Fanolian's Te la Moculus. Jacotat read aloud slowly while students followed his reading in a dual translation to their own familiar language, and to Fenelion spoken French. Then the process was repeated. After the group reading, each student individually dismantled the entire book into parts, into smaller parts, into paragraphs and sentences, words, and finally into letters and sounds. This followed the natural pattern of scientists, it was thought, beginning with holes and reducing them to smaller and smaller elements. J. Cotat has a reputation as a whole world guru, but any resemblance to the contemporary whole word reading in Jokotat is illusion. His method shifts the burden for analysis largely from the shoulders of the teacher to the student. The trappings of holistic non-competitiveness are noticeable and noticeably absent. Penalty for failure in the class was denial of advancement. Everyone succeeded in Jokotat's system, but then his students were highly motivated self-selected volunteers all of college age from jacata we got the idea anybody can teach anything his was the concept of the ignorant schoolmaster it should should, should. it should surprise no one that the ideas of jacata interested prussians who brought his system back to germany and modify it for younger children for them, however, a book seemed too impractical a starting point. Perhaps a sentence, or would maybe a single word would be better. Eventually, it was the latter that was settled upon. Was this the genesis of whole word teaching, which eventually dealt American reading and ability a body blow? The answer is a qualified no. In the German normal word method, the whole word was not something to be memorized, but a specimen of language to be analyzed into syllables. The single word was made self-conscious vehicle for learning letters. Once letter sounds were known, reading instruction proceeded traditionally. To a great extent, this is the method my, mother, my German mother used with my sister and me to teach us to read fluently before we ever saw first grade. Frank had a dog. His name was Spot. Two flies now enter into the reading ointment in the persons of Horace Mann and his second wife, Mary Peabody. There is raw material here for a great intrigue novel. In the early 1830s, a minister in Hartford, Thomas Gallaudet, invented a sight-reading, look-say method to use with the deaf. Like Jacotat, Gallaudet was a man of unusual personal force and originality. He served as the director at the Asylum for the Education of the Deaf and Dumb in Hartford. Deaf mutes couldn't learn a sound symbol system, it was thought, so Galiud devised a sight-reading vocabulary of 50 whole words, which he taught through pictures. Then his deaf students learned a manual alphabet, which permitted them to indicate letters with their fingers and communicate with others. Even in light of the harm he inadvertently caused, it's hard not to be impressed with Galiud. In Gallaudet's system, writing transmuted from a symbolic record of sounds to a symbolic record of pictures. Gallaudet had invented English as an ancient Babylonian. One of his former teachers, William Woodbridge, then the editor of American Annals of Education, received a long, detailed letter in which Gallaudet described his flashcard method and demanded that education be regarded as science, like chemistry. 
Mind like matter can be made subject to experiment. Fifty words could be learned by memory before introducing the alphabet. By removing the dull and tedious normal method, great interest has been excited in the mind of the little learner. Historically, three important threads run together here. One, that learning should be scientific and learning places a laboratory. Two, that words be learned ideographically. Three, that relieving boredom and tedium should be an important goal of pedagogy. Each premise was soon pushed to extremes. These themes institutionalized would ultimately require a vast bureaucracy to enforce. But all this lays in the future. Galadut had adopted the point of view of a deaf mute who had to make his way without assistance from sound to spoken language. Samuel Blumenfeld's analysis of what was wrong in this, in this is instructive. It led to a serious confusion in Galadut's thinking concerning two very different processes, that of learning to speak one's native language and that of learning to read it. In teaching the deaf to read by sight, he was also teaching them language by sight for the first time. They underwent two learning processes, not one. But a normal child came to school already with the knowledge of several thousand words in his speaking vocabulary, with a much greater intellectual development which the sense of sound afforded him. In learning to read, it was not necessary to teach him what he already knew, to repeat the process of learning to speak. The normal child did not learn his language by learning to read. He learned to read in order to help him expand his use of the language. In 1830, Galladu published the Children's Picture Defining and Reading Book, a book for children with normal hearing, seeking to generalize his method to all. In its preface, the book sets down for the first time basic whole word protocols. Words will be taught as representing objects and ideas, not as sounds represented by letters. He who controls language controls the public mind, a concept well understood by Plato. Indeed, the manipulation of language was at the center of curriculum at the Collegia of Rome in the Jesuit acad academies and the private schools maintained for children of the influential classes. It made up an important part of the text of Machiavelli. It gave rise to the modern arts and sciences and sciences of advertising and public relations. The whole word method honorably derived and employed by men like Galadut, was at the same time a tool used by any regime or interest with a stake in limiting the growth of intellect. Galadut's primer, Lost to History, was published in 1836. One year later, the Boston School Committee was inaugurated under the direction of Horace Mann. Although no copies of the primer have survived, Blumenfield tells us, from another source we know that its first line was, Frank had a dog. His name was Spot. On August 2nd, 1836, Gallaudet's primer was adopted by the Boston Primary School Committee on an experimental basis. A year later, a report was issued pronouncing the method a success on the basis of speed learning when compared to the alphabet system and of bringing a pleasant tone to the classroom by removing the old, unintelligible, an irksome method of teaching certain arbitrary marks or letters by certain arbitrary sounds. A sight vocabulary is faster to learn than letters and phonograms, but the gain is a Trojan horse. Only after several years have passed do the sight reader's difficulty learning words from outside sources begin to become apparent. By that time, conditions made pressing by the social situation of the classroom and demands from the world at large combined to make it hard to retrace the lost ground. Mann endorsed Gallaudet's primer in his second annual report of 1838. His endorsement, Gallaudet's general fame and public adulation, erroneous reports circulating at the time that mighty Prussia was using a whole word system, and possibly the prospect of fame and a little profit caused by man's own wife, Mary Tyler Peabody, whose family names were linked to a network of powerful families up and down the eastern seaboard, to write a whole word primer. The Mann family was only one of the hosts of influential voices being raised against the traditional reading instructions in the most literate nation on earth. In Woodbridge's Annals of Education, a steady tattoo was directed against spelling and the alphabet method. 
By the time of Galadut's affair, both mans were under the spell of phrenology, a now submerged school of psychology, and the brainchild of a German ph physician, Francis Joseph Gall. In working with the insane, he had become convinced he had located the physical side of personality traits like love, benevolence, acquisitiveness, and many more. He could provide a map of their positions inside the skull. These faculties signaled their presence, said by Gall, by making bumps on the visible exterior of the cranium. The significance of the future of this reading is that among Gall's claims was, too much reading causes insanity. The mans agreed. One of Gall's converts was a Scottish lawyer named George Combe. On October 8, 1838, Mann wrote in his diary that he had met the author of that extraordinary book, The Constitution of Man, the doctrines of which will work the same change in metaphysical science that Lord Bacon wrought in the natural. The book was Combe's. Suddenly, the Mann project to downgrade reading acquired a psychological leg to accompany the political, social, economic, and religious legs it already possessed. Unlike other arguments against enlightenment of ordinary people, all of which invoked one another forms of class interests, what psychological phrenology offered was a scientific argument based on the supposed best interests of the child. Thus, a potent weapon fell into pedagogy's hands, which would not be surrendered after a phrenology was discredited. If one psychology could not convince, another might. By appearing to avoid any argument from special interest, the scientific case took the matter of who should learn what out of the sphere of Partesian politics into a loftier realm of altruism. Meanwhile, Combe helped man line up his great European tour of 1843, which was to result in the shattering seventh report to the Boston School Committee of 1844. The sixth had been a plea to phrenologize classrooms. This new report said, quote, I am satisfied our greatest error in teaching children to read lies in the beginning with the alphabet, end quote. Man was attempting to commit Massachusetts children to hieroglyphic system of Gallaudet. The result was an outcry from Boston schoolmasters, a battle that went on in the public press for many months, culminating on the schoolmaster's side in this familiar lament. Education is a great concern. It has often been tampered with by vain theorists. It has suffered from the stupid folly and delusive wisdom of the treacherous friends, and we hardly know which have injured it most. Our conviction is that it has much more to hope from the collected wisdom and common prudence of the community than from the suggestion of the individual. Locke injured it by his theories, and so did Rousseau, and so did Milton. All their plans were too splendid to be true. It is to be advanced by conceptions, neither soaring above the clouds nor groveling on the earth, but by those plain, gradual, productive, common-sense improvements which use many, which use many encourage and experience suggest. We are in favor of advancement, provided it be towards usefulness. We love the secretary, but we hate his theories. They stand in the way of substantial education. It's impossible for a sound mind not to hate them. The Pedagogy of Literacy Between man's death and the great waves of Italian immigrants after the 1870s, the country seemed content with Macduffie's readers, Webster's spelling books and the Pilgrim's Progress, the Bible, and the familiar alphabet method for breaking the sound code. But beginning about the year 1880, with the publication of Francis W. Parker's Supplementary Reading from Primary Schools and his Tales on the Pedagogies, 1883, a new attack on reading was mounted. Parker was loud, affable, flamboyant teacher with little academic training himself, a man forced to resign as principal of a Chicago teacher's college in 1899 for reasons not completely honorable. Shortly thereafter, at the age of 62, he was suddenly selected to the head of the School of Education at Rockefeller's New University of Chicago, a university pattern after the great German research establishments like Heidelberg, Berlin, and Leipzig. As supervisor of schools in Boston in a former incarnation, Parker had asserted boldly that learning to read was learning a vocabulary which can be instantly recalled as ideas 
when certain symbolic signposts are encountered. Words are learned, he said, by repeated acts of association of the word with the idea it represents. Parker originated the famous Quincy movement, the most recognizable starting point for progressive schooling. Its reputation rested on four ideas. First, group activities in which the individual is submerged for the good of the collective. Second, emphasis on the miracles of science as opposed to the traditional classical studies of history, philosophy, literature, informal instruction in which teacher and students dress casually and call each other by first names, treat all priorities as flexible. Fourth, the elimination of harsh discipline is psychologically damaging to children. Reading was not stressed in Parker's schools. Parker work, Parker's work and that of the other activists antagonistic to reading received a giant forward push in 1885 from one of the growing core of America's new psychologists who had studied William Wundt at Leipzig, James McKean Cattell, boldly announced that he had proving using the tastiscoscope that when we read whole words and not letters, call cartels, Cattell's lusty ambition resounds in his cry of triumph. The year results are important enough to prove those to be wrong who hold with Kant that psychology can never become an exact science. Until 1965, no one bothered to check Cattell's famous experiment with the tachyoscope. When they did, it was found that Cattell had been dead wrong. People read letters, not words. It was out of cauldrons of Columbia's college that the most ferocious advocate of whole word therapy came. Edward Burke Huey was his name. His mentor, G. Stanley Hall. In 1908, they published an influential book, The Psychology and Pedagogy of Reading, which laid out the revolution in a way that sent a message of bonanzas to come to the new educational book publishing industry. Publishing was a business just beginning to reap fantastic profits from contracts with the new factory schools. Centralized management was proving a pot of gold for lucky book contractors in big cities. The message was this. Children should be taught to read English as if it were Chinese, ideographically. Huey was even more explicit. He said, children need to learn to read too well. Huey was even more explicit. He said children learn to read too well and too early, and that was bad for them. He must not, by reading adult grammatical and logical forms, begin exercise and mental habits, which will violate his childhood. As Blumfield said, to whom I owe much of the research I cited here, explains, Huey concocted a novel justification based on Darwinian evolution for jettisoning the alphabet system. The history of language in which picture writing was the long the main means of written communication has here a wealth of suggestions for the framers of the new primary course. It's not from mere perversity that the boy chalks or carves his records on a book and desk. There is here a correspondence with, if not a direct recapitulation of the life of the race, and we owe it to the child to encourage his living through the best there is in this pictic pictography stage. Dick and Jane. As many before him, Huey missed entirely the brilliant Greek insights that reading and understanding are two different things. Good reading is the fluent and effortless cracking of the symbol sound code, which puts understanding within easy reach. Understanding is the translation of that code into meaning. It is for many people a natural and fairly harmless mistake. Since they read for meaning, the code-cracking step is forgotten. Forgotten, that is, by those who read well. For others, self-disgust and despair engendered by halting progress in decoding sounds sets into play a fatal chain of circumstances which endangers the relationship to print for a long time, sometimes wrecking it forever. If decoding is a painful effort filled with frustrating errors, finally a point is reached when the reader says, in effect, to devil with it. Another piece of dangerous philosophy is concealed inside whole word practice. The notion that a piece of writing is only an orange one squeezes in order to extract something called meaning. Some bit of data. The sheer luxury of putting your mind in contact 
with the greatest minds of history across time and space, feeling the rhythm of their thought, the sallies and retreats, the marshalling of evidence, the admixture of humor or beauty or observation, and many more attributes of the power and value language possesses has something in common with being coached by Bill Walsh in football or Toscanini in orchestra conducting. How these men say what they say is as important as the translating their words into your own. The music of language is what poetry and rhetoric are about. The literal meaning, often secondary. Powerful speech depends upon this understanding. By 1920, the sight word method was being used in a new way of progressive schools. In 1927, another professor at Columbia Teachers College, Arthur Gates, laid the foundation for his own personal fortune by writing a book called The Improvement of Reading, which purported to muster 31 experimental studies proving that sight reading was superior to phonics. All these studies are either trivial or highly ambiguous at best, and at times, in a practice widely encountered throughout higher education research in America, Gates simply draws the conclusion he wants from the facts which leads elsewhere. But this piece de resistance is a comparison of first-grade deaf pupils tutored in the whole word method with Detroit first graders. The scores of the two groups are almost identical, causing Gates to declare this a most convincing demonstration. Yet it had been well known for almost a century that deaf children taught with a method created expressly for deaf children only gain a temporary advantage which disappears quickly. In spite of this cautionary detail, Gates called this, quote, conclusive proof, quote, that normal children taught this way would improve even faster. Shortly after the book's publication, Arthur Gates was given the task of authoring Macmillan's Basal Reader series, a pure leap into the whole word method by the most prestigious education publishers of them all, Macmillan. Macmillan was a corporation with wide-reaching contacts, able to enhance an author's career. In 1931, Gates contributed to the growth of a new reading industry by writing an article for Parents Magazine, New Ways of Teaching Reading. Parents were told to abandon any residual loyalty they might have to the barren, former, older method and to embrace the new as true believers. Later, an article written by Gates' associate was expressly tailored for Quote, those parents concerned because children do not know their letters. Quote, it explained that the modern approach to reading eliminated the boredom of code cracking. With its finger in the wind, Scott Forsman and the large educational publishers ordered a revision of its Elson Basic Readers, drawn on the traditional method, a series which had sold 50 million copies to that date. To head up the mighty project, the publisher brought in William S. Gray, Dean of the University of Chicago College of Education, Rockefeller Foundation, to write its all-new whole world pre-primer and primer books, a series marking the debut of two young Americans who would change millions of minds into mush during their long tenure in school classrooms. Their names were Dick and Jane. After Gates and Gray, most major publishers fell into line with other whole word series in the words of Rudolf Flesch, inherited the kingdom of American education with its fat royalties. Blumenfield does the student of American schooling. Blumenfield does the student of American schooling a great service when he compares this original 1930 Dick and Jane with its 1951 successor. In the 1930, The Dick and Jane pre-primer taught 68 sign words in 39 pages of text story with an illustration per page, a total of 565 words, and a teacher's guidebook of 87 pages. In 1951, the same book was expanded to 172 pages with 184 illustrations, a total of 2,603 words, and a guidebook of 182 pages to teach a sight vocabulary of only 58 words. Without admitting any disorder, the publisher was protecting itself from this system, and the general public, without quite knowing why, was beginning to look at its schools with unease. By 1951, entire public school systems were bailing out on the phonics and jumping on the sight-reading bandwagon. 
out of the growing number of reading derelicts poised to begin tearing the schools apart, which tormented them, a giant remedial reading industry was spawned. A new industry completely in the hands of the very universities who had with one hand written the new basal readers and with the other taught a generation of new teachers about the wonders of whole word method. New evidence that Scott's Forsman wasn't just laughing all the way to the bank, but was actively trying to protect its nest egg in Dick and Jane was its canny multiplications of words intended to be wor- learned. In 1930, the word look was repeated eight times. In 1951, 110 times. In the earlier version, O repeats 12 times, and the later, 138 times. In the first, C gets 27 repetitions, and in the second, 176. The legendary children's book author, Dr. Seuss, creator of a string of bestsellers using a controlled, quote, scientific vocabulary supplied by the publisher, demonstrated his own awareness of the mindlessness of all this in an interview he gave in 1981. I did it for a textbook house, and they sent me a word list. That was due to the Dewey Revolt in the 20s, in which they threw out phonics reading and went to word recognition, as if you're reading a Chinese pictograph instead of blending sounds or different letters. I think killing phonics was one of the greatest causes of illiteracy in the country. Anyway... They had it all worked out that a healthy child at the age of four can only learn so many words in a week, so there were 223 words to use in this book. I read the list three times, and I almost went out of my head. I said, I'll read it once more, and if I can find two words that rhyme, that'll be the title of the book. I found cat and hat, and said, the title of my book will be The Cat and the Hat. For the 41 months beginning in January of 1929 and concluding in June of 1932, There were 88 articles written in various pedagogical journals journals on the subject of reading difficulties and remedial teaching. In the 41 months beginning in July of 1935 and concluding in December of 1938, the number rose almost 200% to 239. The first effects of the total victory of whole word reading philosophy were being reflected in academic journals as the once mighty reading Samson of America was led eyeless to Gaza with the rest of the slaves. Beautiful. For those of you that carried on with me in that journey, I thank you so much for it. Isn't that just a beautifully written chapter? Gosh. That's the difference of somebody that's well-read. You know, before I published my book, It takes a long time to go from having a book that you've written to having it edited and to having it actually bound up and published. I had a conversation with Dr. Michael Lake. He shared with me a few pieces of advice to help me get to a place of finish line, to get me to the finish line, you know? But one of the things that he stressed was that if I go through traditional editors and publishing houses, right? to tap into that market, right, with publishers, their well-acquainted marketing and advertisement schemes. They they wanted to reduce the reading, the version at which he was reading and he was writing his book. They said he needed to reduce it to a third grade level. That's how the audience of the actual readers, the readability that most people actually have in the demographics of the United States was about a third grade level. He told me, you basically have an option. You can just write it at the way that you've written it and just let it be, or you can write it at the third grade level and more people will be able to read it. And I was shocked at that. And for so long, that has been in the back of my mind. And I've been sitting there wondering like, what, why? That's one of those like little loose threads in the garment that I've got to pull on. And all my life, I'm just sitting there waiting until the right pieces of evidence drop into my lap and I'm able to identify why. And you know what? This is the the literal, what I just read to you in an hour, right? That's like the actual diagnostic steps of what it took to get there, to take an entire nation that was some of the most well-read and well-advanced in literacy. And because of that, 
they were capable of doing so many things. They were experts in so many different arenas that they were able to see through the facade of all the character experts that the ruling elite like to bring around in front of everybody to persuade the masses through propaganda and to make sure that they listen to them because you can trust them. They're from the government, right? They were able to totally smell Benanki on all of it. They're like, this smells like poo poo, sir. You know, they had colorful flowery language as a baseline for their normal conversations in life. And they were so much better at navigating through society because of that. But they instead have turned us into this mutant mush pile. They can't understand darn near anything. But you know what? The cure, I'm sincerely convinced, the absolute cure. I talked to Chelsea here when he took a break. And I asked her again, like, what was it that really helped you? And she said, no, honey, the thing that made the biggest difference that helped me overcome my inabilities to read in a lot of ways was reading out loud the scriptures with you. It was taking turns, her and I going back and forth, reading the Bible together. And you know what? It suddenly hit me. You know why that happened? Because I was obeying the commandments. Okay, let's go to Ephesians. If I say... If we follow these scriptures like they're actually the guidelines to life, it literally helps to cure us. Check this out. Husbands, this is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Messiah also did love the assembly and gave himself for it in order to set it apart and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word in order to present it to himself, a splendid assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of this, but that it might be set apart and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but feeds and cherishes it, as also the master does the assembly, because we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This secret is great, but I speak concerning Messiah and the assembly. However, you two, ever, let everyone each, everyone, let each one love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she fears her husband. It says, husbands, our job is to wash our wives in the water of the word. By me sitting there washing her with the water of the word, it literally helped to build her confidence and wash her free of the shame and the guilt that it had experienced in all of that pressure cooking cauldron of chaos of the modern schooling systems. My wife was able to perform satisfactorily to an excellent level in school. Meanwhile, she was filled with a deep shame and pain about her weakness. But over the time, as her and I sat down and read these scriptures together, it got to wash her of that stuff. And it got to give her an opportunity in a sincerely loving environment and one where it wasn't like I was going to judge her and mock her because she had to stop and sound out words. Even as I was doing that reading, I had to stop and sound out words as I was going in there. I confronted some words as I was reading through there that as I tried to read it out loud, I understood in my head I can read through it a lot faster when I have to try to pronounce it out loud, I'm going to have to slow down, you know, but it's good for us. It's good for us to experience those micro challenges. So I, my challenge for you, if you guys have carried on through this with me here, listen, read, start this way. One of the ways that like, I, I prayed for wisdom, like ever since I first read those words about how Yeshua had grew in wisdom and stature and favor with man and with Elohim. That's always been some of my biggest prayers my whole life. And so one of the ways that I pursued that was to read a chapter of the Proverbs every day. I would follow every day of the month and whatever day of the month it was, that was the number of the chapter in Proverbs I read. And I'd encourage you, start by reading a chapter of Proverbs every day out loud. If you have a husband or a wife or children, start by doing that to collectively as a family. It'll help you to grow in wisdom and understanding. The book of Proverbs in and of itself, you could go through it twelve, basically 12 times every year, just the book of Proverbs. And I'm telling you, you're going to come out of that with a tapestry of understanding on a vast majority of different topics. That's written by a man, a couple different authors, but predominantly by Solomon, a man who is clothed with wisdom from Yahuwah, 
with knowledge, with understanding, and with wisdom. And it wasn't just his ability to read, but his ability to communicate the concepts that he'd learned throughout his life that is so valuable. That's why Ecclesiastes is such a valuable book for us. These are things that we can find in the scriptures if we glean from them. If you have not read the wisdom of Solomon, this is what was in the 1611 Bible that he was talking about earlier. An incredible book of wisdom that diverse, that goes through so many of the other lessons that he learned some of it on the dark side, things that he learned because of his time spent leaving the path of righteousness. And when he came back to it, man, he dismantles and shares what's going on in those circles of blood and how you can guard yourself and your family from it. It's incredible pieces of wisdom and understanding that are beneficial to us that I would encourage you to read and examine for yourself. But anyways, I love you guys so much. Thanks for going on this wonderful journey with me. Take some time in your life, study the word. And you know what? If you feel any shame or embarrassment about your inability or the struggles that you've had to read, start asking the father to help you and give you the ability to read and understand that what you're reading. So that hunger for the word that you can have, that desire to read and understand the word would grow and multiply. But you know, as for us, any one of us that has children, we have an opportunity to break that cycle. We have an opportunity to have anything we do in our life to instill in them a hunger for the word, the ability to read it, the ability to understand it, and the ability to use it as a sword to navigate this life as a compass to guide them on the narrow path of life. I love you guys so much. I look forward to talking to you again soon.